So the title of my talk, as Dr. Santi has just said, is Nudging a Pseudoscience Towards a Science, uh, which is the role of statistics in a rainfall enhancement trial. Sorry about that. Trying to move things around uh, in a rainfall enhancement trial in Oman. And uh, I basically thought that this might be an interesting presentation given uh, the conference in Jakarta at the moment is about science and mathematics. And statistics is often viewed as a part of mathematics. And mathematics is, as it were, the handmaiden uh, of science. And statistics, if one thinks of it, is, is, is somewhat like having the house cleaner around in science. Uh, statistics tries to make sure that science um, does the right thing. And uh, one of the things uh, I want to talk about today is how, it, how it's useful in uh, a science which is not really a science in the sense that it's been labeled as pseudoscience uh, and how statistics might help uh, in, in, in moving it towards more of a scientific basis. So here's the overview of my presentation. I'll talk about weather modification, why it's often called a pseudoscience. Uh, cloud seeding is probably the best known type of rainfall enhancement mechanism uh, used in weather modification. Um, but there's also other types of um, weather modification, uh, rainfall enhancement techniques. And the one I want to focus on is something called ground-based ionization, which is not accepted, uh, uh, which is not always uh, accepted as being a scientific method. And I'll talk about testing ground-based ionization both in Australia and Oman, and then go on to some lessons we may have learned from that. So what is the aim of rainfall enhancement? Well, as the name says, it's about making it rain harder. Weather modification, uh, according to the World Meteorological Organization, is persistent and recurring changes in local or regional weather patterns due to human intervention. And rainfall enhancement is essentially increasing the amount of rainfall when it actually does rain. Uh, now, the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, is not too convinced about rainfall enhancement. Uh, and this becomes clear uh, when you see their statement on weather modification, 2000. 2010, uh, which says effectively it's impossible to create cloud systems that rain. Uh, any technology that claims it can do such things should be treated with suspicion. Uh, augmentation of pres precipitation, any type of uh, cloud modifications uh, are really still striving to achieve a sound scientific foundation. They're not really scientific. Um, the economic analyses, um, really, there may be strong economic benefit, but the uncertainties make any uh, investment in these efforts considerably risky. And so there's a, a need for a lot more strategic research. And perhaps what I'm going to be talking about is really that this continuing strategic research and how it might help. So here are the WMO requirements for pro proper evaluation of a weather modification activity. Uh, first of all, you have to have some sort of random, randomized experimental uh, procedure for deciding whether you actually have increased the rainfall or not. The primary analysis of the data obtained in such an experiment should be based on using objective statistical techniques. And it should really provide an estimate of increased rainfall on the ground uh, and, and confidence intervals. In, in so the, some assessment of the true impact uh, of the, uh, rain, the rainfall increase can be, can be obtained. But also, and this is an important thing I'm gonna come back to right at the end, there should be some secondary analyses which basically confirm that the, hypo the, the rainfall enhancement actually took place. So they provide physical support for the primary analysis, which is the statistical analysis, by explaining the scientific basis uh, of the statistical result. And because there is a huge natural variability in rainfall, uh, the, any, any investigation should be viewed as a long-term commitment. 
So we, 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 we're not going to be able to assess these things just by uh, perhaps trying to do it over a week or a month or even uh, two or three months. This is a long-term, many-year commitment. And this is precisely the type of commitment that actually happened in Oman. All right, just a bit of background in cloud seeding. I think most of you may be aware of the cloud seeding concept, but this is a small graphic which illustrates you have a plane which is flying above uh, clouds. Uh, it discharges chemicals, typically silver iodide pellets. These act as nuclei for condensation in the cloud, and this can either come out as more as ice uh, precipitation or as increased uh, rainfall. Uh, call either glaciogenic seeding, when you have ice face precipitation induced in very cold clouds, or hygroscopic seeding, which is coalescence of water droplets in warmer clouds. And hygro hygroscopic seeding is essentially the uh, focus of the techniques that I want to talk about today. All right, so in terms of cloud seeding, the World Meteorological Organization has an opinion. Um, I'm sorry, Prof. Ray. Please turn on your mic first. Prof. Ray. Please turn on your mic. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I hope, I don't know what caused that. Could you hear me before? Um, a little bit. Okay. No problem. Uh, how about now? You can is continue okay? that. Is it okay it's now? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm now talking about cloud seeding and the World Meteorological Organization opinion on cloud seeding, which, as you can see in front of you, says, as far as glaciogenic seeding is concerned, there is some statistical evidence, not well, very strong. I, I'm not sure. I, I can hear other people talking as well. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, there is also seeding of convective clouds with hygroscopic materials, which is not yet an established technology. Okay, so basically, uh, Effectively, convective cloud seeding is not really viewed as something that's terribly sensible. Well, there is an alternative to cloud seeding, which is ground-based ionization. And these ideas were initially developed by Bernard Vonnegut at GE Labs in the United States in the 50s and 60s. And he, in fact, was a cloud seeding pioneer in uh, discussing the use of silver iodide in clouds. But he also uh, investigated the effect of electrical forces on droplet collision and growth and advocated the artificial electrification of clouds. Now, he published his work and really sat, that sung into ob obscurity. But in the 1980s and 1990s in Russia, a gentleman called Valery Ubo uh, developed what's called the Atlant approach to ground-based ionization using atmospheric uplift. There's very little published work, uh, in fact, none in, that are, that's not in Russian uh, from this Russian work in the, in, in the early 80s and 90s. Um, so we have to just look at the, if we go the technology and see how it works without having any sort of theoretical basis for understanding it. So this is a Atlant, an early Atlant mechanism over here. Uh, you can see it looks like a whole bunch of wireframe pyramids. Um, 
essentially the idea, there's lots of wire strung around these pyramids and aerosols, small atmospheric dust particles, become negatively charged or ionized after exposure to a high voltage corona discharge wire array. So you have very, very high voltages going through the, these wire frames. Then what happens is these, these things are placed where there is atmospheric uplift. So you have convection currents, turbulence in the atmosphere, then negatively charged aerosols, which effectively come off this mechanism, are then carried into the cloud layer where they act as condensation nuclei for cloud, cloud droplets. Now, the, 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 the most important thing is that the electrical charge carried by these new cloud droplets influences their collision and subsequent coalescence into larger raindrops. Now, this is a controversial uh, assumption uh, and one that many atmospheric physicists probably would not agree with or say would be impossible. But recent research coming out of China has indicated that maybe our models for what's going on uh, are perhaps need modification. So I'll give a reference there to Wang et al. in 2020. In any case, the change rate of coalescence uh, has a significant effect on the amount of rainfall from clouds that are downwind uh, of, the, of the Atlant mechanism. Now, the thing with this is that there are people involved in this area who perhaps take advantage of these ideas. And this is an experiment that was carried out in Abu Dhabi uh, in 2011, which claimed to have caused it to rain in the desert. Now, I take that, those claims with a large amount of salt. Um, and in fact, uh, a prominent meteorologist at the US National Center for Atmospheric Research said it is very sad that rain enhancement by methods that have no scientific basis or at least have never been exposed to a scientific evaluation get the headlines. So you can see that there are people who are in this area who are perhaps taking advantage uh, of, of sort of perhaps other, other, the lack of knowledge of what, what, how these things work. In any case, the Atlant experience in Australia has been somewhat mixed. There were five trials of this mechanism in Australia, starting with a, a, a one would say a proof of concept trial in Southeast Queensland in 2007. And there was very strong opposition uh, to uh, the results from this trial. Uh, in fact, there were statements like Rainmate, Rainmaker Ian Searle, the father of cloud seeding in Australia, says all the literature is seen on the technology so it shows it to be a bogus science, which is why I had that title earlier on. There was another trial, uh, 2008, in Bundaberg, which is also in Queensland, uh, and that's where the Atlant was continuously operated. There was a dynamic target area introduced. There was an attempt to get a semi-scientific assessment of what was going on over here. Then trials three, four, and five were in South Australia near Adelaide, and particularly trial, the fourth and fifth trial used proper randomized uh, experimental design, a randomized crossover design. They used upwind rainfall to predict downwind rainfall so they can control for the current conditions. And they used something called a random effect block bootstrap in order to assess the attribution. I'll come to that in more detail shortly. But as far as Australia is concerned, that was a dead end. Although there was a consistent about a 10% enhancement every time they tried these things. There was no interest from the government in Australia to fund further Australian trials, uh, despite the recommendations of an independent scientific review panel. Uh, so the technology was marketed overseas, and that brings us to Oman, uh, where the government of Oman agreed to fund further trials in 2012. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are sort of aware or knowledgeable about Oman, but it, is, it lies at the tip of the Arabian Peninsula. It's one of the most water-stressed countries in the world. Uh, and rainfall enhancement trials using the Atlant system uh, were carried out in the Hajar Mountains of Northern Oman. Uh, and also in the, uh, between 2013 and 2018, six years, and in the Southern Dofa region in 2018. The trials were locally managed. 
the meteorological data was sourced from the Oman effectively Department of Meteorology called DGMAN. And the assessment of the data collected in the experiments was, and was, was done here at Wollongong by uh, eco, eco, economic, economic consultants and Analyticon, as well as National Institute for Applied Statistics Research here. And what I'm gonna give you quickly is a short summary of what was found out. So here is a, a picture showing you the black curve shows you the uh, temperature you can see uh, between January and December in that part of Oman. Uh, and the blue uh, bars show you the rainfall. And you can see that over the summer, which is basically May through September, there's almost no rainfall. Uh, there's uh, very high temperatures and almost no rainfall. But there are, there is convective clouds uh, and there is rainfall in the mountains. And that is the most suitable time for rainfall enhancement. This is two pictures. This is showing you Oman. Uh, so over here, you can see the Haja Mountains. They go along the northern part of Oman over there. And this is from the Times of Oman, July 30th to 2020. That's about what, a week and a bit ago. Uh, cumulus clouds uh, active on the Haja Mountains leading to isolated rains and thunderstorms. And the, and the cumulative clouds are very, very clear in that satellite photo. So how did the Oman thing go? Well, first of all, there was a startup uh, where there was a proof of concept trial in 2013, just using two Atlants and a randomized crossover design. And that was subsequently extended to a five-year trial, uh, 2014 to 2018. Here's H1 and H2, which are the first two Atlants. They're the traditional sort of shapes. Um, this is showing you the deployment uh, of the Atlans 2013 to 2018 in the Haja Mountains. Now you have over here, uh, the orange circles are rain gauges that were installed. Uh, the red diamonds are the various Atlans that were installed in the mountains. And then you have the green diamonds over here, which are the, D, the meteorology DG man weather stations. Uh, in addition to which, vertical sonic wind profilers or SODARs were installed at a couple of the Atlant things to look at basically to allow assessment of where the uh, ionized aerosols were eventually ending up. The light's gone off here automatically. I've got to put it back on. Okay, this is a picture showing you, you can see these are subsequent Atlant models deviating from the triangle model, but all on the base, same basic principle of ionizing uh, aeros uh, uplifted aerosols. Uh, the rain gauges, which you saw in that previous thing, this shows you essentially there were 120 gauges installed prior to the start of the 2013 trial. Uh, and that went up to two, or just uh, two, 201 gauges by 2017. Uh, and uh, you got the deployment of the gauges in 2013 here, and then the eventual extent of all the gauges that were installed by 2017 over there. So there were a lot of gauges placed specifically for the purpose of this trial. Uh, I also talked about the DG Man weather stations. Uh, there were a number of weather stations involved uh, and contributing data to the analysis. And this shows you the ones that contributed over different years. Uh, they vary from year to year, basically because of missing data. Um, not, not all data was provided by all uh, weather stations in every year. But uh, when, when avail these, are the, these are the variables which they tended to have uh, most regularly which is wind speed, dry air temperature, dew point temperature, relative humidity, and air pressure. Probably the most important uh, thing that was necessary for anal analyzing these trials was the wind direction. And this was obtained from the Digiman radio sonde at Muscat International Airport, which every day gives you data on vertical wind profiles as well as uh, values of key meteorological indices. Uh, 
Um, and the measurement of steering wind direction and speed is ob obviously crucial for identifying where an operating atlant has a rainfall enhancement effect because effectively any rainfall enhancement has to be downwind. And so you have to know where downwind is and that is essential in our analysis of the trial data. So there is a 4 a.m. as you can see over here, a 4 a.m. radio sound every day. Uh, it's a standard one. But in addition, in 2015, 2017, and 2018, extra radio songs were uh, put up just to see how the wind direction changed during the day. In the end, the analysis was done just using the 4 a.m. radio sound data. Uh, just go back a bit. One of the thing about it again here, missing data is a problem. You can see that you start off with uh, a reasonable amount of days with data, but in 2017 and 2018, there was a lot of missing data on the radio sounds. There were a lot of they were changing over the system at the airport, and there was a lot of missing data. Okay, this shows you the schedule um, uh, for when the uh, Atlants were operated. Um, and the only exceptions, it was a randomized operating schedule. Uh, it was defined each year before commencement of operations that year, strictly followed irrespective of weather conditions. It didn't matter whether there was clouds or not, they just ran. Uh, the only exceptions are obviously when the machines themselves uh, had uh, issues. Uh, and there was missing radio sound data, as I've already talked about. The design of the Atlant operating schedules varied depending on the number of Atlants that were operating that year. So for example, in 2013, there was a randomized crossover schedule. Then there was a randomized paired crossover set, uh, scheme used in 2014. And then from 2015 onwards, effectively a randomized schedule subject to spatiotemporal balance constraints which ensure the equal number of operational and non-operational Atlants each day, and no Atlants operated more than two days in succession. And any given day, the operation of more than two adjacent Atlants in the same day was sort of minimized. The Atlants themselves were switched on and off at 7 a.m. local Oman time. Rainfall, 2013 to 2018, uh, the analysis was done at gauge by day level. There were 122,259 gauge day rainfall measurements over the six year period, over 740 days. The average gauge day rainfall was 0.35 of a millimeter, but 92.5% of gauge rainfall values was zero. This is a desert country. So in fact, when rain did fall, which is the average gauge day positive rainfall, that was 4.74 millimeters. In fact, over the six years, you can see that there is a dramatic drop in rainfall. These are bubble plots showing you at gauges on the year, the amount of rainfall that was recorded. And the uh, figures over here in red are the average positive gauge day rainfall each year. And you can see it drops as you're going from 2013 through to 2018. And you can see also the drop, the drop away in rainfall uh, those days. Uh, so not only have you got issues with a, a very little uh, rain being recorded, but also each year there appears to be less rain available, less moisture available uh, in the atmosphere. As far as steering winds are concerned, although the main steering wheel winds are from the northeast, um, uh, this shows you the wind directions, uh, and the mainly from north northeast and east northeast. Uh, actually, the most rain tended to fall from the south, and that was basically due, we think, well, was, was it associated with monsoonal uh, type uh, fronts coming through. The most important issue, as far as analyzing Atlant's concerned, is its footprint. Where is the rainfall enhancement effect going to be seen? And so that meant we had to model or at least try and work out what the Atlant plume was doing. Uh, and that was determined by upper level wind directions in the free atmosphere above the boundary layer. So this is where the sodas came in. And the footprint model that was, uh, was used throughout the uh, trial was a 75 kilometer long by 30 kilometer wide downwind aligned corridor with origin centered on an active Atlant. 
So effectively, the assumption was that whatever was going to happen was going to happen in this corridor downwind of an atlant. Uh, now, we look at gauges that are in the corridor on a given day. There's target gauges, which are downwind of an active atlant, at least one. Control gauges are downwind as well, but there are not downwind of any active atlants. And of course, you have, you look back up the corridor over here, and you have the upwind gauges, which tell you what sort of weather is coming downwind, and therefore has nothing to do with any of the rainfall enhancements. Here's a plot showing you the average target and control rainfall. Uh, so here's the control rainfall each year. This is average positive uh, rainfall. Here's the target rainfall. And you can see that target rainfall tends to be greater than uh, control rainfall. There's upwind over here, and this is out of scope. This is things that are not in the corridors. The statistical modeling process itself uh, went through various stages, uh, four stages. It used a hurdle type model, which essentially is the thing is you model, first of all, the probability of rainfall happening. And then given rainfall happened, you model the amount of rainfall. So there were two models fitted uh, for the amount of rainfall. One was for upwind rainfall and the other one was for downwind rainfall. So the reason we fitted two models uh, this way was upwind rainfall was effectively used as a controlling variable for downwind rainfall. And then the differences between actual positive downwind gauge day rainfall and the natural rainfall predictions which come out of our models were then used to estimate the attribution, which is the key thing, how much rain actually, extra rain fell on the ground. Here's a slide which I'm not really going to spend any time on, but essentially gives you the fairly standard, not very effectively how we actually got to the attribution. But the main thing about it is the attribution itself is the difference between total observed rainfall and total predicted natural rainfall uh, uh, over the trial period. So uh, we are really saying, okay, we, we know we've seen so much rain, we use our model to predict how much natural rain should have happened, and then we look at attribution as the difference between them. By the way, that the, the uh, total predicted natural rainfall could be less than the total observed rainfall. Uh, so in fact, you could see a negative attribution. Um, the model covariates used in our models, these come from all the various sources that were there, uh, mainly used in setting up the upwind model. Uh, and this was then used as to define expected rainfall, which was then used in the downwind as the main covariate in the downwind model, as you'll see. Confidence levels. Uh, there's a lot of temporal and spatial variability over here. A random day effect was added to both downwind and upwind models in order to allow for imperfect model specification. A two-stage block bootstrap sampling strategy was used that also included predicting whether rain occurred or not. Uh, was used to assess the uh, co confidence intervals on the attribution. And then and finally, a non-parametric permutation uh, test was used again to actually test for causality uh, in the attribution process. Here's the uh, fit for over the four, six years for the upwind model, uh, showing you the estimates and the T values. Red obviously is highly significant. These are T values greater than two, absolute values greater than two. Uh, you can see that all those uh, covariates over there, gauge elevation, wind speed, total totals is a meteorological uh, sort of imminent rainfall type measure. Uh, temp dry two is a second principal component uh, of dry temperature. Relative humidity is one is the first principal component of relative humidity and pressure one is the first principal component of pressure. Uh, there were 292 days worth of data for upwind uh, and 1,545 actual gauge day observations over the six years. When we come to the downwind model, uh, there are only really two main covariates in it, which is the elevation of the gauge and from the upwind model, the expected rain that we expect downwind. And then after that, you have a whole bunch of indicators for whether the observation comes is a target observation and which uh, Atlant is it a target for. 
And then you have two interaction terms over here for the very high atlants, which were basically a, a necessary and certainly in modeling the 2013 data. There were 488 days worth of data, 4,168 actual observations uh, in this model. And you can see over here, you've got red for H1, red for H2, red for H3, and red for H5. So at least uh, four of the Atlants were highly significant in terms of their impact on, on downwind rain. And they were, and, uh, but there's also a negative here and a negative there, which means at least H4 and H6, rather than having a positive uh, downwind rainfall effect, appear to have had a negative downwind rainfall effect. So it, the, the picture is not as clean as you would like it to be. All right, now in terms of actual inference uh, for the Atlant, uh, I said a hurdle type model was used, it was bootstrapping. Uh, the bootstrap it allows you to assess uncertainty in attribution due to likely alternative rainfall patterns. Uh, here we have plots showing you the bootstrap distributions that were generated. Uh, this is for the actual attribution measured in millimeters. This is the relative gauge day attribution percentages. And there was an overall 16 point, bit over 16% uh, attributed rainfall due to the operation of the Atlants. Uh, the final thing that was done was a non-parametric permutation test for a causal relationship between Atlant operation and enhanced rainfall. And it was based on the null premise that if Atlant operation does nothing to enhance rainfall, then the actual operating sequence should have no impact on attribution. So what you do is you just modify, you play around with this, this operating sequence, you permute it and calculate each time what the attribution would be as if the permuted sequence was the actual one used, and then look at the distribution of attributions you obtain. And if there is no effect, one would then expect the actual attribution estimate to lie somewhere in the body of this permutation distribution. Well, this is what you obtain. This is the permutation distribution of attributions. And this is where the actual estimate that was obtained. So you can see that you have to use the actual operating sequence in order to get the attribution uh, that, that was observed. The, it does matter how the Atlants work. So what have we learned so far? Um, there's huge variability in rainfall data. We need large data sets, and I think I've just illustrated one. Fairly complex analyses, but that means you need deep pockets and long planning horizons to obtain the data. And the Oman trial, I think, provides an example of what is possible in this regard. The other thing, of course, in terms of science is correlation is not causation, but it is an extremely good indicator that something is going on. Replication is an even better indicator and the Oman government has now incorporated the Atlant technology into its water infrastructure and is carrying out further experimentation, which we will see whether that confirms what was observed in the trial. The trial data themselves are freely available, should be a strong incentive for further research, but it's very difficult, even with very good statistical results, to change what I think is fairly entrenched scientific opinion. And certainly not helped uh, when you have pseudoscientific profiteers uh, playing around, uh, as is in this particular arena. So has the Homan trial been a proper evaluation of the Atlant technology? Well, we've met all the WMO requirements, as it's listed over there. The only WMO requirement that has not been met is secondary analyses that validate the treatment hypothesis. That is basically observational data showing the, if you want to call it, the enhancement, the coalescence of uh, raindrops uh, from the ionized uh, aerosols. Um, nudging against a closed door perhaps here, because as far as traditional science is concerned, statistical analysis itself is never enough. The causal mechanism for the treatment impact should be empirically verified. But that requires direct measurement of ionized aerosols and how they encourage raindrop coalescence in nature. This, is, this has been seen many times in cloud chambers, but to see it in nature is very, very difficult indeed. So given current technology, we can't do it, but there is actually a trial going along at the moment uh, in northwestern uh, China, 
uh, which may in fact come out with some results in that, that respect. In any case, much of real science actually fails this requirement, even though it's said to be one. Um, this is a quote by a uh, title of an article by Carolyn Johnson in the Washington Post in 2015. One big myth about medicine, we know how drugs work. We don't know, but they do work. Thank you. I'm sorry I took so long. Are there any questions? Hello. Okay, thank you very much for delivering very interesting presentation, Prof. Ray. Next. Hello? Yes, I'm here. You? Okay, thank you, Prof. Ray. Should, Next should week, I... Open... Uh, sorry? Sorry. Should yeah. I stop screen sharing? sharing? Uh, yeah, it's okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so, Prof. stop share. There we are. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next we will open a discussion session. Um, for all attendants, please ask or directly, or you you can write your question in the rain, uh, in the room chat. Okay, there is no question yet, but maybe I can ask you, perfect. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, this is very interesting topic, but um, I'm curious about uh, the influence uh, of the area around Oman. Yes. Is there a significant influence of the area around Oman which if, uh, affect the rainfall in Oman? Uh, the normal rainfall patterns in Oman, uh, essentially there's monsoonal rain, um, mm -hmm. and that happens at certain times of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. But in summer, essentially the only rainfall are these convective clouds over the Haja Mountains. Uh, mm -hmm. And also in the south of Oman, there is uh, rainfall, also some convective clouds, although mainly ground mist. Uh, so in summer, there's really no rain. It's only in winter there's rain. Uh, and but in summer generally there's not widespread rain some some convective cloud that sometimes you get an occasional early monsoon or a late monsoon I'm not sure 100% which way it goes but uh, really uh, between about July and September October the, the only rainfall is that which is observed in the mountains and the, the, the attempt is to increase the amount of, of rain that comes down out of those clouds in the mountains. Okay. Um, the second question for me, is it okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the what kind of uh, sampling method that do you use uh, if you want to randomize the Atlant? The, the the atlants themselves they were operated on a it depended on how many there were but at the end there were 10 atlants in the mountains mm -hmm. okay and so the these the the the, the 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 procedure was effectively a, a uh, monte carlo search uh, uh using a uh, among a, a a set of possible experimental designs where every atlant uh, was, uh, there were four atlants, sorry, there were five atlants on each day, five atlants off, equal mm -hmm. numbers on and off. Um, no, any atlant that was on one day had to be off the next day. Uh, mm -hmm. And also atlants that uh, were uh, if effectively um, too close together uh, were discouraged. So you had a, 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 a very large number of potential designs that mm -hmm. had this sort of characteristic. And essentially what was done was to, 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 to essentially search among these designs using a Monte Carlo search in order to find one that had all the requirements you did, uh, you, you, were, you were looking for. But it was, it was a random, it, was, it, it wasn't a, 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 a search in any, it was a complete random process uh, which didn't 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 have any specific uh, sort of set outcome. And the other thing, important thing about it, and this is really important, 
is the design was set in place before the trial started. So this isn't, wasn't a situation where after you see the clouds, you decide whether to run the Atlant or not. The complete operating sequence was defined in April, usually in April or, or at, the, at the latest in May. And from then on, it was followed. Uh, it did, and, and, and it didn't matter whether there was cloud or no cloud, the Atlants were turned on and off and measurements were taken. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Ray. Now, uh, there is a question um, from chat room. I, I, I will read this question for you from Mr. Anang Kurnia. Kurnia. This is my lecturer in University of ITB. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, it is a nice topic. Rain is a source of life. So it is interesting to continue to study, including in Indonesia. But Australia and Oman, I think, have different atmosphere and uh, environment. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. Uh, did different environmental condition in Australia and Oman produce different results of this experiment? Could multi uh, multi location test applied for this research? There are two questions for you. Yeah, no, no, no. I think that that's a, a very good question. A, a very, very good question. Um, it is clear. Uh, by the way, the conditions in Australia around Adelaide were quite different from the conditions in Oman. All right, um, the, the Oman, those mountains are very high. Um, it is clear that if you have the conditions that operate, that, that exist in Oman, high mountains, convective clouds forming at the middle of the day in the mountains uh, with, with rainfall uh, happening up there, you, you have, and, and, and strong winds, strong uplift, you have the conditions for this sort of technology to work, okay? Uh, a similar sort of thing in, in, in Adelaide, but there wasn't high mountains. It's more, there was a prevailing wind coming over the sea towards the Atlant and then moving things inland. By the way, the Chinese uh, researchers are doing a very similar experiment as we speak, but their uh, ground ionization equipment is currently set up on essentially on, 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 on the edge of the Tibetan plateau. So they are looking at the same sort of thing where you have high, high mountains and you have a lot of uplift and therefore you have aerosols coming, which you can then ionize uh, and, and create rain further, or not create rain, enhance rain further downwind. Now, if you go to another area, for example, I gave you the example of Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's just desert or United Arab Emirates. It's flat. Um, there are no mountains. There is no condensation. Uh, there are no convective clouds. There's no point putting this mechanism there. It's a waste of time. It's not going to work. It's like throwing seed on a barren ground. Why would you do that? There's nothing there. There's no water. There's nothing. So you've got to have the conditions for this to work. Now, which conditions? I think that requires assessment. That's why I said replication is really good. Try this thing out in different areas where it should work. Remember the hypothesis was you needed uplift, you could ionize the aerosols, but you needed moisture in the clouds. If you have those conditions, then it should work, but we really need to replicate this. This really needs to be done in many different parts of the world before we can start to say, yes, it works. Uh, at the moment, Oman, Australia, who knows where next? Well, China next, actually, uh, but we will see. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Ray. I'm so sorry because our time is up. I think this is a very interesting topic and valuable for us. And before we close this session, would you like to give a closing statement, please? Oh, well... A closing statement. <laughs> I didn't realize I had, a, I had to have a closing <laughs> statement. Uh, I, I have no real closing statement beyond I was, uh, like I said, 
that the object of, of, the, of the conference is to look at the intersection between science and mathematics. Uh, and this is, this is one intersection. It's not the standard one, uh, but it is where statistics actually can have an impact. Um, too often statistics is just used in order to, if, as it were, polish what is a clear result. Uh, here, there is no clear result. The data are very messy, but statistics is being used to try and bring out something which is almost hidden. There is a hidden uh, effect over here. And we're trying to use statistics to bring out the hidden effect. So in that sense, I hope it may be interesting to people who, are, who have listened to this uh, talk. Um, and who knows where it'll go from there. But uh, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak.